Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Howard webinar. I'm Marcello Bagdellini, Communication and Dissemination Manager of Build It Project. It's my pleasure to take you through this joint initiative among three H2020 like-minded projects, Build It, Feed to Endure, Heart and Abracadabra. As you may have seen from our social media, we are positioning our initiative in the framework of the World Cities Day, being an international initiative promoted by the United Nations. The theme of this year is building sustainable and resilient cities. And we, as you project dealing with energy efficiency measures, technologies, demo sites, find this initiative as the perfect place to share our knowledge. This is our agenda. As you can see, we will go through two main topics, technologies for retrofitting existing building stocks and financing the renovation. And we will do so by learning from each other and sharing the experiences and lessons learned from all projects. Questions from the audience are more than welcome and we have dedicated the last time slot for this purpose. If any question pops up in your mind, please take note of it and take the chance to the last session to ask it. To interact with the speakers, you can use either the chat box, which you can find at the bottom right corner of your screen, or raise your hand by clicking on the icon at the top center of your screen. Please make sure to specify whom you, or which project you are addressing with your question. To conclude the housekeeping from my side, I inform you that the webinar is being recorded to ensure that additional web users can watch it in the future. So it's now time to start, and I'm hand now handing over to Mr. Roberto Fedrizzi, who is Build It Project Coordinator. Roberto, please, the floor is yours. Roberto, I can ask you to unmute your microphone. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Marcello. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I was saying good morning, everybody, and thank you, Marcello, for, for this introduction. Um, yeah, the idea for today for Build It is to show you a bit of the background. Um, which is the start of the of the project uh, activities, and to show you some of the technologies um, that we are testing uh, or installing so far, demonstrating so far. So basically, the background of the project to to uh, to start with the presentation is the deep energy retrofit of residential buildings with a, with a focus on on multifamily houses. And again, the background is that uh, when someone takes over a, an energy retrofit of the building that is normally highly inv invasive, long-lasting. It takes months and, and months to, from, from, the, from the idea to the uh, end of the retrofit. It is complex for installers because they need to integrate multidisciplinary, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, background. And it's also expensive uh, in the end uh, where energy savings are paid only after a long period that normally owners do not want to bear. Um, so basically, um, to reply to this uh, or to yeah, start working on these uh, problems, on these issues, uh, we didn't build it. What we did is to, uh, on the one end, work on the standardization of the solution and on the prefabrication. From the invasive point of view, what we what we do is to basically work uh, on the facade of the building without uh, uh, entering too much into the into the single dwellings. Uh, what we do is to work on bringing outside the the, the construction site uh, most of the of, of the work, therefore uh, with a long uh, with a long with a detailed. Uh, design process and uh, uh, and off-site manufacturing prefabrication of the solutions. Uh, that most of the time, or what we are trying to do, is to have them plug and play 
in a way that the installation phase is uh, uh, shortened on the one end, and on the other end, it is um, uh, made more uh, reliable and and less, um, say, error prone. Um, in the end, we are also working on uh, uh, on uh, uh, financing models, but I don't want to to talk about this because uh, we have a dedicated session later on. So once more. Um, Okay, sorry for this. I didn't see this um, yeah, problem. Uh, what we, as I said before, what we are doing on, is on the one end to work on um, um, packages of solutions that adapt to different uh, uh, multifamily house um, uh, cases. And on the other end, we also work on um, um, developing management uh, strategies for the heating and cooling systems uh, e e system uh, of this uh, of these buildings this the, on, on the first uh, um, side on the other side of the problem or the technical problem we have uh, the uh, prefabrication so we, what we want to do is to develop these uh, technologies that uh, with a goal to um, reduce the uh, retrofit co uh, retrofit cost to around 40-50% of the new build, which is um, translated into euros. Uh, it is about 400-600 euros per square meter living area overall. Um, as I said, um, we are also going to, to work on financing and um, uh, of the, of the uh, building retrofit, moving the uh, financial burden from the single owners public or private, whatever they are, um, to um, um, institutional investors that, that, uh, that uh, in, um, can manage, uh, say, bureaucracy and, and, finance, and financial issues uh, much better than private. As I said, I, I won't speak about uh, this um, financial part. I will concentrate on the technical part, and in particular, we show you some of the technologies we are developing. And to start with, um, this is one. As I said, we are working on plug and play, all in one solutions. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the technologies we are developing. We started from an all in one, uh, heat pump plus ventilation system by Clivet. <coughs> this, um, this is a box which is as uh, big as a fridge, more or less, and that provides you heating, cooling, domestic hot water and ventilation. That is already available on the market, and what we are doing is to, um, however, in the project is to uh, connect this uh, directly to um, small uh, PV fields that we install on the on the facade of the building, and the direct connection is made in a way that uh, we maximize the self-consumption of the PV electricity generated. For you to, to understand a little better, let me see if I can show you a, a picture, yeah, a, a an arrow. Yeah, this the um, this the unit itself once more. And what we are developing is this small box that you see on the right side, <coughs> which is a micro inverter, one kilowatt peak um, PV electricity generated that can fit directly into the uh, into the heat pump like in this position. 
and basically what the inverter does is not only to produce uh, PV electricity and to drive the, the heat pump, but to all, it, it is to also uh, talk, communicate with the heat pump in a way that um, yeah, the heat pump knows uh, when PV electricity is available, when irradiation is available, so to say, and then the heat pump decides how and when and uh, how and when uh, to use the PV electricity, either to um, um, drive the inverter of the heat pump itself or to, uh, for example, drive uh, some uh, electrical resistances that are set into the um, domestic hot water tank uh, placed in this position in the, in the box. Um, as we said, however, uh, we want to uh, connect these to small PV fields that we uh, set on the on the hang on the facade of the buildings. And what we do, uh, what we are doing for uh, for this, is to develop, or we, what we did is to develop um, was to develop this uh, macro panel, as we as we call that, which is nothing else than a, a, an aluminum. Um, this one, not easy to, to point. This one, um, which is an aluminum uh, structure, as you will see next in in, in the next slide, uh, slide, that can be um, hung on the um, on the dwelling on the uh, building floors, um, so so that there is no structural uh, load on the on the. On the bricks, for example, in the uh, on, on the walls, on the facade itself, but only on the slabs, and basically the the structure can uh, um, can um, bear some cladding material uh, as a covering material, or it can hang some uh, active elements, like we will see in the next slides, and it can be um, uh, positioned to a distance from uh, from from the existing facade, so that uh, we can install uh, wires, pipes, ducts uh, as um, um, as thick as as needed, and again the gap can be filled with insulation. The gap between the panel and the uh, and the existing facade can be filled with insulation. So from the um, from a more technical point of view, this is what you have basically. This is the anchoring system to the to the facade existing facade and the macro panel and this is the anchoring system as you can see the distance can be adjusted uh, to virtually any distance from the from the facade as much as it is needed for the insulation to be installed and for the pipes and ducts to be installed um, the gap is filled with insulation and again the macro panel itself can be filled with insulation um, or not depending on the needs uh, if it is Filled with insulation, it can act as a, a cap to cover uh, pipes and ducts. When uh, uh, once again, if it is not filled uh, with insulation, then the macro panel can act as a normal ventilator facade solution. Um, this is from the conceptual point of view, and this is how it looks like. Our mock-up looks like. Uh, this is two macro panels. Um, one next to the other and covered with uh, with a uh, with a cladding solution and filled with uh, uh, with uh, insulation on top of the uh, on top of the insulation that is placed in the uh, on the facade itself and this is the anchoring system. Um, as I said before, um, the cladding is not the only solution. The same anchoring system can um, host um, solar thermal collectors. We found solutions to, to for the anchoring of uh, specific brands, um, commercial brands, um, into the same uh, macro panel structure, and to host also the uh, pipelines to connect different uh, uh, panels to one to another or to the main system. And what we did is to also um, uh, find a solution to anchor on the same panel also PV panels. Um, so that basically the same structure can be used on the on the facade to uh, to host and to install different uh, passive and active uh, elements. Um, for you to understand how we used it, 
uh, how we use the, the solution. I go directly into a demonstration site. This is the building we have in Saragossa. It is a multifamily house with 50 dwellings. And uh, it, uh, this is how it looked uh, before the retrofit. So um, a non-load-bearing uh, uh, brick wall uh, facade, like the, the one you see here on the right side. Um, very bad uh, performance, both of the facade and of the, of the windows, because they are uh, single glass. So what they did uh, on the one end uh, in Saragossa um, it was to retrofit the, the facade uh, with the normal insulation, and they substituted the, the windows with double pane ones. But uh, part of the, of the facade, meaning uh, the east side, which is this one, and the west side were uh, retrofitted with our uh, um, with our um, macro panel solution, and this is how we looked uh, on the on the side. And here you see um, during the installation phase that they first installed the um, um, the the, um, the normal insulation, rock wool insulation. Uh, with the uh, spaces for the uh, wires, for the uh, for, for the ducts, for the uh, uh, PV panels, um, uh, electric ducts for the uh, for the PV panels. Here some pan some macro panels installed, and here uh, all but the the PV panels. And in the next slide, you see the final result. So basically, this is the north facade. And uh, on the other end, you see the south facade uh, of the building. As you can see, those are retrofitted with normal um, and with normal cladding, uh, with normal insulation. Sorry, thermal insulation. The east facade, which is this one, is then set up with our solution and the PV panels. And you can see something like uh, 16 PV panels that are driving to uh, to. Um, two dwellings, so, uh, so to say, the one on the first and the second floor. Um, actually, we are, in, uh, we are not uh, finished with the, with the retrofit, but we are installing now, uh, or in the next weeks, uh, we are going to install the, um, the plug-and-play, say, all-in-one heat pump plus ventilation solutions. Uh, here on the, on, on the uh, map, on the um, horizontal section, uh, you should see three dwellings, uh, one, two, and three. Um, again, north and south facade. And uh, basically, the uh, plug-and-play solution, heat pump solution, are going to be set into the uh, kitchens of the, of, the, of the three dwellings. Uh, the supply and uh, waste uh, air uh, ducts are going to be connected to the, to the south facade, while the distribution of fresh and, uh, and return air are going to be um, in, um, distributed through uh, duct lines, uh, uh, through ducts uh, hanging on the on the ceilings, and either uh, above um, full ceilings made of uh, plasterboard plasterboards. Uh, each of the um, each of the uh, units are going to inst to be installed to uh, small PV fields. The two PV fields I already mentioned to you, so these ones, one and two, or to P uh, or two uh, PV fields that are set on the on the roof of the um, of the of the building. Again, in this case, uh, the 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 PV fields are a little smaller. Something like uh, uh, five panels in, instead of uh, eight panels, and uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, the installation is a normal one without uh, building integration. Um, this was uh, two of the solutions we we developed. Um, we have another technology which is um, especially inter interesting for uh, central um, heat pump systems. Which is this one that you see on the right, on the left side, and which is uh, um, also in this case a commercial um, um, tank, small size, 140 liters, that's special, especially suited for um, uh, installation in, into single dwellings. 
Um, it is nothing really innovative apart for the fact that it is flat and it is something like 20 uh, millimeters uh, thick, uh, 20 centimeters thick, obviously. And again, then um, this is really uh, useful for uh, for installation into into single dwellings because that is uh, that can be hung on 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 walls. Um, again, the innovation here is that we want to use it to maximize the utilization of uh, solar thermal um, energy harvested from collectors that are set uh, once more uh, uh, on, on facades in addition that uh, and, and again to increase the uh, thermal capacity the overall thermal capacity of the of the building in addition to the tank uh, the, the the compound the box includes also um, um, uh, the distribution system as you can see here in the bottom part of the box and the uh, and what we did in the in the project was also to include here you see in the reality how it looks uh, what we did is to also include monitoring um, of the uh, thermal energy consumption and also the control as you can see here we have a small PLC unit that uh, decides when the uh, when the thermal energy is to be provided to the uh, accumulation tank. On top of this, uh, we also uh, decided to uh, include other fun functionalities uh, which are useful for the for the dwelling, which is uh, ventilation once once again. And on top of the tank, what you see is that we um, uh, added um, a mechanical ventilation unit which is sufficient to provide uh, ventilation to a single dwelling and uh, that is installed on top of the uh, uh, tank before it arrives on, on site, on the construction site. And again, uh, in this way, we cover a couple of um, yeah, um, needs, or say the thermal needs and the ventilation needs of the dwelling all in one unit. And we try to reduce as much as possible the, the installation time. <clears throat> this is how uh, it looks and uh, how we want to, um, where we want to use it. Uh, the, the, uh, this unit is going to be uh, set um, in, in, uh, in a multifamily house in, in Rome, which is this one, 80 dwellings seen, uh, on eight floors. Uh, each dwelling is owned by a different uh, private owner. The building is this one in a big uh, city quarter um, with many other of those uh, large multifamily houses available for replication. And again, in this case, we are going to retrofit uh, uh, with normal insulation the building. But again, the south-facing facade, which is one, this one that, uh, that you see indicated by the green arrow, is going to be set up with uh, um, uh, with the uh, macro panel solution, and uh, part of the facade obviously is going to be uh, completely passive. Part of the facade is going to be um, set up up to up to here. So the the, bot the the top part of the of the facade is going to be set up with the solar thermal collectors. Uh, from a schematic point of view or a functional point of view. This is how the tank is going to be uh, used. So basically, the tank can provide heating and cooling to the single dwellings and then domestic hot water. So heating and cooling and domestic hot water to the, um, to the, to the tank. And again, we have a PLC dealing with the, with the control of the single and uh, monitoring and control of the single uh, yeah, dwellings. Um, those are going to be installed in each of the uh, in each of the apartments outside the, the balcony, so to say. And the main advantage of this is that we can increase very much the thermal capacity of the building um, without um, having too much um, weight or too much uh, thermal capacity concentrated in the technical room. For you to understand. The technical room is going to be set up on top of the of the of the building, on the roof of the building. So again, we cannot concentrate too much weight over there, and this is a good advantage. The other advantage of having dwelling um, tanks is that we can 
uh, decide to charge them during certain hours of the of the day, and we avoid that we have recirculating water into the uh, into the pipelines, into the riser, into the risers from the technical room to the single dwellings that is continuously flowing all through the day. So again, we reduce by much uh, the uh, by quite a lot the uh, thermal losses through um, through the risers uh, for, for domestic hot water circulation. Again, um, I think I have to conclude. Uh, I'm going to too long. Um, I don't want to um, spend too much time explaining what we are doing. But again, these were only a few examples of uh, of our uh, work and and developments. What I wanted to um, say to finalize the the, the presentation is um, or what I wanted to highlight is, is some lessons learned. Um, out of all this prefabrication and and uh, yeah uh, all the approaches I, I showed to you, and again the first is that the installation process of this solution is quite fast, uh, but again it requires quite a lot of coordination among the uh, designers and installers um, all through the uh, all through the process, and these are lessons learned that is not only coming from building but also from other projects in the. Uh, previous projects we, we ran into. The second point is that this prefabrication can be an help, but again, the uh, professionals, the installers, are not used to use them. Uh, and again, they need quite a lot of training before they are, uh, say, fluent or rapid in, in the installation. Otherwise, uh, despite the, the prefabrication, they commit quite some error before they uh, they Thank they you are. very much. Uh, the installation is for your presentation um, of the project and especially uh, for the last um, also the uh, the takeaways that you are giving us um, as a final remarks. Uh, I'm sure that um, they have um, pointed uh, many uh, ideas to our um, partners and participants uh, to this webinar. So I can't ask everybody to keep the question for uh, the final time slot. And um, thanks a lot again, uh, Roberto. I would move to the next speaker. And uh, to this extent, I invite uh, uh, Rizal Sebastian, project coordinator of uh, P2 um, Endure. Uh, please, uh, the floor is your Rizal. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rizal Sebastian. I live and work in the Netherlands, and uh, I am the initiator and coordinator of the p 2 Angel project. Well, before I continue to share some ideas from our project, I would like to thank uh, Marcelo in particular and also Built Heat uh, Project Consortium for inviting us uh, to this webinar. It feels really nice to be part of this World Cities Day as initiated by the United Nations. Many of us know that uh, every year on this day, the 31st of October, the United Nations uh, uh, proclaimed this World Cities Day based on a resolution that was taken in 2013 or something uh, related to the uh, Human Settlements Program, so which is known as UN Habitat. And most of us have been working on European projects. And I think from time to time, it is, uh, it is nice to realize that we are also part of the world. <laughs> and this is uh, part of the global initiative. Well, uh, let me continue uh, by telling you uh, our experience so far from the p 2 ngo project. To start with, this is a project co-funded by the European Commission. We started uh, exactly two years ago, and we still have two years uh, to go. This is a four years project. Uh, we are uh, working together in a consortium of 16 partners from uh, five or six European country, sorry, countries. And we are covering the whole value chain of building renovation. So having said so, uh, in our consortium, we have uh, building owners with uh, uh, existing buildings subjected to deep renovation. Uh, we have architects, we have uh, structural engineers, energy engineers, HVAC uh, designers, uh, IT uh, specialists, and of course uh, uh, 
construction firms, large and small, and also um, uh, universities and research institutions. Well, the P to Endure. Uh, I think you have seen the full title of the project on the first slide. It uh, represents plug and play product and process innovation for energy efficient building deep renovation. It's a mouthful, but actually our mission is quite simple. Uh, we want to give evidence uh, of the innovation and the added value of plug and play solutions for deep renovation. We are aware that there are, I think by, by, by this time, more than 30 uh, research projects funded by the European Commission related to uh, renovation and plug and play prefabrication uh, technologies for uh, renovation. Uh, so we will not reinvent the wheel. But uh, we are also aware that the level of uh, take up of this uh, innovation in the market is still too low. So that's why the main mission of this P2NG project is to show the real evidence that it is working, that it has a real added values, it is affordable, and it can be implemented at a large scale. Having said so, of course we uh, have defined our technical goals. Uh, since we, most of us are researchers, so we stick with these goals. Uh, the, the technical goals are, first of all, we review and redefine the whole process methodology for deep renovation, what we call the 4M methodology. I will explain that in more detail in the next slide. Uh, and then we uh, investigate the readiness of the plug-and-play solutions especially for retrofit of building envelopes and uh, uh, HVAC or MEP systems. Uh, surely we want to select uh, and use the most relevant and most practical ICT tools uh, in relation to building information model, BIM, building energy modeling, BIM, and several software tools for analysis of uh, cost, decision making, asset management, and so on. And last but not least, our goal is to demonstrate these innovations in real life. So we have a series of uh, real deep renovation projects. Moving on with uh, uh, the goal, uh, uh, we try to achieve our target, not only talking about innovation, but we want to make it uh, measurable, uh, make it quantifiable. So these are the measurable indicators of our achievement. Our target is to achieve at least 60% energy saving compared to the situation before renovation. Um, and this is within the definition of deep renovation. Uh, along with that, uh, we also think about cost saving. So our target is 15% cheaper than traditional renovation solutions and also time saving. Uh, with plug and play technologies, we believe that we can cut the time for renovation on the site uh, uh, with 50%. So, as I said, we are still in the middle of the project. We are uh, achieving some of these indicators, but uh, there's a long way to go. So, I hope you will bear with us until the end of the project and we can uh, show the evidence whether or not we have achieved all these targets. Well, as I promised you, uh, I will explain the 4M modular process methodology for plug and play deep renovation. It's again uh, quite simple. We define the whole deep renovation cycle into four main stages, which we identify with these four M's. Starting with mapping, uh, followed up by modeling, and then making and monitoring. In other words, mapping is uh, to obtain the information about the condition of the building before renovation. Modeling is very much about the renovation design. Making uh, very much deals with the real tangible uh, uh, product uh, solutions, uh, plug and play solutions. Most of them, as you can imagine, are prefabricated, but some of them uh, are also made directly on site 
for example, with the 3D printing technologies on the building site. And last but not least, uh, since we want to give evidence, so we uh, plan to do monitoring to, to compare the energy performance before and after renovation. And not only about uh, energy efficiency, we are also taking care of the user comfort and their satisfaction. So this is the 4M process methodology. Uh, I will show in the next slide how each of these steps has been implemented in our project in, uh, in relation to one or more real demonstration cases. Before that, I just want to say that we are not only uh, dealing with uh, systems and uh, technology innovation, but we are aware of the importance of non-technological innovations. For example, uh, what I mentioned just now, user comfort, satisfaction, but also the awareness of users, uh, because they play an important role uh, to achieve the real target of energy saving in deep retrofitting. So our approach in the P2NG projects uh, is based on three levels. Uh, the first level is very much uh, focused on plug and play prefab systems and 3D uh, technologies. Uh, the second level, we are dealing with the instruments, mostly ICT instruments that uh, are needed to support uh, this uh, deep renovation uh, concept. And last but not least, uh, also related with awareness raising, uh, related with giving real evidence to uh, motivate a larger uh, size of public to really take up this innovation into the market, we are concentrating on real demonstration cases. Let's uh, see what we have been doing uh, within each of these four M uh, process. Let's start with the first M which is called mapping. Uh, one of our demonstration cases for this uh, purpose is the building in Genova, in Italy. So what we have done, first of all, we take uh, the uh, existing conditions, technical conditions, but also uh, user characteristics of this building. And we used uh, uh, IT tools, both on desktop as well as mobile application for uh, building surveying. At the same time, we created this as-built 3D model or BIM model of the existing building. Uh, in some cases, we use 3D scan uh, technologies. Other cases, we uh, reconstruct the, the BIM model based on two-dimensional drawings and documentation and sometimes supported by laser measurement. So this is mainly the activities within the first M stage, the mapping continue. Uh, the second stage is modeling. Uh, and this, uh, this stage in P2NG is divided into the BIM modeling for renovation design and the building energy modeling or BEM uh, modeling for the energy simulation. Uh, for the renovation design, we have developed this IT tool which we call the BIM parametric modeler where you can uh, simulate and uh, compose different uh, solutions for your renovation strategies. Uh, based on your uh, selection, an indicative uh, performance level uh, can be visualized. So in this way, you can already make some considerations uh, uh, where you, you want to optimize the performance because we are not only talking about energy, as I mentioned, but also about user comfort, uh, satisfaction, uh, cost uh, effectiveness, and so on. At the same time, each of the renovation strategy is modeled in BEM. And uh, many of you know that the uh, concept of BIM to BEM, so using this BIM model for energy analysis, is an ongoing development in different research projects. We have tried out three different methods for BIM to BEM, uh, uh, either through an open uh, standard and open source uh, methodology or tools, or uh, we use uh, a commercial proprietary uh, software tools. 
and uh, we are investigating and comparing the uh, advantages and disadvantages of each method. But the purpose is the same, to be able to create the energy simulation, energy performance simulations uh, during the renovation design stage. So we have had the first stage mapping, and this is the second stage modeling. The third uh, stage, which is actually the core of the P2NG project, is about making. As I said, we are not only uh, working on a virtual simulation, but we want to involve the building owners, the building users, the stakeholders at real demonstration cases. So I will give you some examples of uh, our activities in the making stage. Uh, similar to the first presentation, uh, in P2NG we are also uh, developing multifunctional lightweight panels uh, for uh, uh, for the purpose of the retrofit for building envelope. And these uh, multifunctional panels uh, uh, does not only include the insulation layer, but uh, can also include HVAC and uh, uh, MFV systems integrated uh, on the building envelope. Another new technology that we have tried out uh, in several buildings is the on-site 3D printing. Uh, don't imagine we, we bring a kind of printer, uh, of 3D printer, which you see more often now on the desk. Uh, this technology is uh, slightly different from that. Uh, our 3D printing is based on a collaborative robotics technology. So that is a portable robot that can work uh, uh, and controlled by a human operator. Uh, and this robot uh, can literally print uh, the facade layer uh, on the building, on the building site. Uh, how to work with this robot? Uh, very simple. First, we take the uh, real condition of the building, the real geometry, uh, mostly based on 3D laser scan. And we use this uh, 3D model. We converted this model into BIM. And uh, we um, uh, use this as input for the steering uh, system for the robots. So in that way, the, the printing can be done uh, with high accuracy and uh, also nice and important, especially for the architects, uh, you can be really creative. So you can uh, have a lot of freedoms in uh, creating this aesthetic aspects of uh, the, the facade layer. At the same time, we are experimenting with uh, various materials for the printing. Uh, these materials can serve as insulation layer as well as finishing layer depending on uh, on your need and on your um, uh, cost expectancy. Um, and we, we are uh, uh, moving on with uh, patterns uh, in collaboration with several uh, material uh, providers. Other examples uh, include the smart windows. Uh, again, uh, this is the same building in Genova, Italy, uh, where we are uh, implementing these uh, windows to replace the existing windows. Uh, smart windows, uh, well, uh, we have different levels of smartness, to be honest. Uh, the essence of the smart window is uh, uh, the ability to be uh, rotated uh, depending on the, the session. So in the winter session, you want to keep the, the, the heat inside, and in the summer session, you want to have more ventilation and uh, to reflect uh, uh, the sun uh, from, from the outside. Uh, this is possible. So it, uh, the window is uh, rotable on horizontal and vertical axis. Uh, it can be made even smarter uh, by integrating with the smart sensors and control system that can automatically uh, or based on user uh, instruction, um, um, operate the window in the way that you, you like it. Yet another example, this one uh, is a building in the Netherlands. Uh, the project is quite interesting since this is a large-scale university building. 
which is being transformed into student apartments, hotels, and conference center. The whole facade uh, is being replaced with plug-and-play uh, panels. Uh, not only the exterior uh, retrofitting, uh, this building is uh, undergoing interior retrofitting as well with plug-and-play solutions for the uh, installations, for the HVAC installation and uh, electrical systems, uh, uh, modular units for bathroom, uh, kitchens, and so on. We hope uh, to be able to see the building uh, early next year because the, uh, the, the project consortium of P2NG will gather in this building and observe uh, the, the finishing of this real deep renovation uh, project uh, in March uh, next year. I think this is the last example from the making stage. Uh, we are combining different possibilities uh, in, in several cases. In this case, in, the, in Warsaw, in Poland, uh, this is a nursery building for, uh, for small children, for young children. So uh, we are performing deep retrofitting of the building envelopes. And uh, we have created a design for the rooftop retrofit because uh, the building owner, uh, which is the local municipality, um, also has uh, a need to have more space for, uh, for the children. And uh, we were thinking like, instead of just uh, putting extra roof insulation, probably uh, we can add an extra floor on the roof. And this floor will uh, contribute a lot for the uh, uh, energy performance as well as uh, giving extra space, um, uh, um, um, centralizing the uh, building utilities at the same uh, at the same spot, and also uh, uh, increasing the comfort, the overall comfort of the building. So here on the left side, you can see the example how we perform the 3D laser scanning uh, of the whole building, and we created a 3D point cloud. And based on that, we created BIM. And uh, we perform the energy simulation BEM uh, based on the BIM model. And we use the parametric modeler to configure different possible uh, retrofitting scenarios. The last but not least, uh, this is uh, just an example of different uh, demonstration cases that we are dealing with. Uh, we have cases in Italy, in Poland, in the Netherlands, in Denmark. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and also in Germany, so I think we represent uh, the, the most important uh, uh, geographic uh, characteristics in Europe. Uh, some cases are uh, ongoing, some others are in preparation. So if you'd like to follow our progress, please visit our website. Uh, and to finish with the 4M methodology, the last stage is monitoring. Uh, we have started the preparation. We use this patented technology developed by the University uh, Politecnica di La Marca from Italy. Uh, this is the uh, device which, uh, which is called the Comfort Eye, which uh, is installed inside the building and uh, which is able to map the energetic properties of the building as well as the user uh, comfort and indoor environment and quality like the uh, temperature, the CO2 levels, and so on. So in that sense, uh, we will be able to present uh, the real achievements by comparing uh, the building performance, the overall building performance, before and after renovation. I'd like to conclude my presentation now. So again, uh, please feel free to visit our website to follow the progress of our project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rizal, for, uh, for sharing uh, all innovative approaches. That this 4HAM approach is really, I think it's really uh, innovative and interesting. Um, everybody keep uh, questions uh, for the final uh, stage of, of our uh, webinar. And thank you, thank you very much, uh, Risa. And uh, I will hand over uh, the floor to um, Claudio De Pedro. 
uh, so for him to introduce uh, us uh, heart project thank you so good morning to everybody can you hear me yes Claudio perfectly okay good morning so since we are late uh, I will try to be very quick with my presentation so um, I would like to uh, present the heart project uh, here you can find some main information about the, the project so the art stands for holistic energy and architectural retrofit toolkit so we are trying to develop uh, a toolkit of uh, uh, technologies but also of uh, ICT tools to um, favor to ease the uh, energy and architectural retrofit of existing buildings and uh, mm, the duration of the project is 48 months and uh, in this moment we are at the very beginning of the second year this is why I will not show you the result of the project but I am just focusing on the objective so what what we want to achieve and we, we hope to achieve uh, I'm part of the group of the uh, Politecnico di Milano that is coordinating the project here you can find also the website, the LinkedIn, the Twitter uh, account if you want to have more information about the project uh, to, to keep, be, to keep uh, up to date about the, the future steps of the project. So we are uh, 16 uh, partners, so it's a, it's a quite a large uh, consortium. Uh, I'm, I think it is very interesting to note that we are just four, um, four entities uh, related to the research, uh, uh, to the research and, uh, and development uh, uh, part, and the, the other, uh, the other um, partner are mainly more small and medium enterprises. So we have a lot of uh, SMD in the, in the consortium, and we are trying to improve the technologies that are already. Uh, being developed and uh, put on the market by by such uh, companies, and we are we, we we want to try to put all these technologies together. Uh, in particular, here you can see to the, the different objectives of the of the project. The first one is to develop systemic and cost optimal solutions for energy retrofit. So, mm, in particular, the first uh, aim is to decrease very much the uh, energy demand for heating, cooling, and consequently the production of the system building. And uh, in the meanwhile, we want to ensure a payback period lower than 15 years. This is very important to, to increase the uh, renovation speed, the renovation rate of the system building in Europe. The second objective is to develop, update, and adapt innovative technologies for systemic improvement, what I mentioned before. We are taking different technologies developed by different companies, and we want to improve such uh, technologies in order to allow a systemic improvement. Usually, when you retrofit a building, you design an inter integrated intervention, putting together a lot of different but uh, in many cases such a technologies are not designed from the beginning to be coupled, to be put together in terms of uh, uh, interconnection, but also physical interconnection, but also in terms of communication. So this is the second uh, goal. The third goal is to foster the building's smart upgrade. So we we know that uh, we have to convert existing building into smart building, ex existing city into smart cities. So uh, this toolkit want to uh, e easy this uh, this process. So to convert a building that is a uh, real life is, is built I don't know 30 or 40 years ago. So without any uh, smart capability into a smart building uh, that is a uh, in interactive building characterized by dynamic and uh, multi-directional flows of energy and information. And uh, again, the objective number four is to support and improve the decision-making process. We know that 
uh, when we start a retrofit process of a building, it's very difficult, uh, or at least it's very time expensive to to uh, to decide which which is the best retrofit strategy for that building in that context in that uh, 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 climate. So we want through the the art uh, decision making tool to decrease the the time with this uh, decision making activity and to to support the designer, building owner, to identify the best and cost op optimal retrofit strategy. So we want, uh, let, let's say, to reduce the uh, decision making time by at least 30% compared to the uh, standard uh, design process. Objective number five, we want to promote energy efficient financing. So this is, uh, in my opinion, another very important point because nowadays we know that it's very difficult to put a uh, big capital, big uh, amount of money into uh, the retrofit of existing building because of the uncertainty and the risk that is related to uh, uh, future performance. I mean energy performance, but also economic performance because uh, it's not sure that the real performance of the building is the one simulated before the retrofit intervention because we are putting together, as I told you before, uh, a lot of different technologies. Because the second uh, problem is the um, influence of the user behavior because we don't know how the user will uh, behave inside the building in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So, the, the, the behavior of the user can influence very much the energy performance and also the economic performance. So, by putting uh, under control the building, the operation of the building after the retrofit uh, through the, the cloud platform that I will show you later, we want to increase the attractiveness of the energy retrofit intervention by um, reducing the risk, basically. So here you can see the application context. So the geographical focus is the central and southern Europe. Uh, so in that part of Europe, uh, we have uh, typically a uh, uh, certain amount of uh, heating energy demand, but uh, we also have a certain amount of cooling energy demand because uh, also because the, the climate change, unfortunately, the, the uh, uh, the cooling energy demand is increasing year by year. So we want to uh, apply the retrofit toolkit to that part of the world because it's uh, uh, the most suitable developing. And the application target are the multi-story residential buildings, so similar to this uh, picture. So are typically four, five, six floors linear condominium buildings with a lot of dwellings uh, with usually a quite regular shape and usually we are with a very low energy performance. So also with high energy cost related cooling physical to And here you can see the structure of the toolkit. So we are putting together, uh, let's say, nine uh, technologies. The first one is a multifunctional thermal insulation system. So you, you saw before in the other two presentations that uh, this is a, a common and well-known strategy because we, we have to move the the, the, the works from the construction and the building site to the, to the factory. So we, we try to realize, also in this case, a sandwich panel with a metal finishing. This sandwich panel will be reshaped in the, in the factory and we will be installed very quickly. Also, avoiding the use of scaffolding construction site, so minimizing the, the installation time, the installation cost, and also all the risks that are related to this 
uh, installation phase. The second technology are techniques and components for the replacement of existing windows. In many cases, the existing windows in such kind of building uh, have a uh, poor performance, energy performance, but uh, they are in a good uh, uh, state of maintenance. So we want to develop uh, several techniques and components to retrofit uh, totally or partially such kind of windows without replacing completely. So avoiding to, uh, to, to destroy the existing window and to install new low-cost uh, windows. Uh, the third uh, technology are universal PV tiles. We know that uh, in such a climatic context, the uh, most widespread and uh, also cheap uh, renewable energy is solar energy. So we want to convert solar energy into electricity by installing on the roof uh, these PV tiles. They will be low cost and uh, universal because we want to adapt such PV tiles to, uh, let's say, the 90% of the different roofs we can install in such kind of buildings. Then we have a cloud-based platform, but I will explain the cloud-based platform in the next slide. Uh, then we have smart uh, DC fan coils. So we replace the existing radiators that, that are typically uh, installed in such kind of building by installing such kind of smart fan coils. They are similar in shape to traditional fan coil units. but they So uh
bottle water to air it pump inside each fan coil. And this fan coil is able to exchange thermal energy with the existing um, uh, hydraulic circuit that is present in the building. So the, the centralized boiler of the building will be replaced with a centralized uh, electric DC heat pump. This heat pump will provide uh, water at a very low temperature in the winter, let's say about 20 degrees, and more or less at the same temperature during the summer. And then each fan coil using unit is increasing the temperature in the winter or decreasing the temperature in the summer by minimizing the thermal losses uh, in the hydraulic circuit that is uh, in many cases is not uh, thermally insulated or has a very low level of thermal insulation. So by this way we are keeping, we are maintaining the same, the, the same existing hydraulic circuit without destroying and doing very intensive works inside the, inside the dwelling. Uh, also the centralized heat pump at the same you see, so everything is powered by the PV system without avoiding the conversion to C, AC and then back to DC control proposes inside the region. Then we have a high efficiency thermal storage because we know that in a smart building we have we need the capability to store uh, electricity and also to store thermal, thermal energy and uh, uh, Currently, the, the cheapest way to store electricity is to store in the form of thermal energy. So the PV system is generating electricity. This electricity is converted into thermal energy, so uh, hot water or cold water, depending uh, on the season, and uh, is stored in this uh, high efficiency thermal storage using uh, phase chain materials. Then we have a battery pack. Uh, let's say that in this case is a second option to store electricity. Uh, currently, the to store electricity in, in batteries is not, uh, let's say, cost efficient. But uh, in the future, uh, the the cost of the battery will decrease very much. So in the system, we also have a, um, a possibility to connect a battery pack. This battery pack is not uh, a product of the research. Just uh, by uh, integrate a commercial solution. Then we have the the centralized heat pump. I already mentioned it before. And the last but not least, this multi input, multi output converter. We call it MIMO because it's um, uh, it's the central uh, dispatching unit that is uh, converting. Powering, let's say, not converting the the DC fan coil, the DC heat pump using the the PV system, but also it allows the connection with the grid because in some moment of the year we need to to, to feed the system using the the, the AC current uh, coming from the grid, or we can have in some some particular condition extra energy and excess energy that cannot be stored inside the building, so we have to put this energy back to the grid. Uh, now, in this slide, I will explain more in detail the function of the cloud-based platform. This platform um, will host a simplified model of uh, the building. So in the first phase, in the decision-making phase, or in the design phase, the designer, or let's say the construction stakeholder, or the foundry stakeholder, can input a lot of uh, information about the building and run the model and uh, uh, obtain the the say the, the details. Thanks a lot, Claudio. Um, again, very interesting um, to see uh, the toolkit and how this can 
also so the, uh, uh, support the, platform, the decision making uh, and uh, the, the platform that you are developing both for uh, users after, and also for investors to check, to check actually the, the economic performance of the investment. I think this is really um, interesting and this is uh, the perfect bridge uh, to, um, to the next uh, session which will start with uh, uh, Federico Stirano uh, who will uh, outline uh, the financial model designed uh, within a building project. Any questions? We'll come at the, the, the final session of the, of, uh, the webinar. Um, I kindly ask Federico to be as quick um, as possible. Sorry for that. We are a bit running out of time. And thank you, Federico. The floor is yours. Okay. Good morning. I am Federico Stirano from City, and we are partner of the BuildIt project, and uh, we are the coordinator of the work package related to finding the financial models for, for the innovative financial models to uh, propose the energy retrofit uh, to spread the use of energy retrofit in residential buildings. Uh, basically, during our analysis, uh, we are trying to understand why uh, it's so important to develop a financing model for energy retrofit. We uh, discovered that there is uh, basically the a lot of market uh, of market opportunities, as the majority of residential buildings in Europe was built before 1990s. Around 80 percent uh, were have uh, this uh, year of construction, where the requirements of energy efficiencies was not the focus, was not the primary focus for designers and engineers. So there is a lot of need to comply with the current standard of energy efficiency. The European Commission has an expected rate for of 3% of uh, yearly renovation in order to reach the uh, climate goals set by the, poli by the European policies of uh, environment. But the current retrofit rate, uh, average retrofit rate, is in the order of 1.5%. So there are we are needed to better identify which are the obstacles that prevent the diffusion of the technologies and retrofit projects to reach the expected rate by the Commission. The main uh, obstacles are basically the owner's engagement, the access to finance, and the uncertainty of final savings. And this is more or less uh, the, the same uh, issues that uh, I heard before also for the other projects. Basically, on the uh, evaluation of the final savings uh, on the future to understand the performance of the different uh, technologies and also the possibility for the owners of the building to access the finance and to involve uh, large capitals from uh, private or public investors in the, in the process. For, for this reason, some specific models and um, financing models might must be defined and uh, to pave to, to the way for this uh, in involvement. It's important to also to understand which are the different actors that are involved in the retrofit process, starting from the owners, the designers, the contractors that will, be, will do the, the works, the financial institution providing the monetary resource, the building manager that may be acting as a, an interface between the owners and the other actors, especially in case of multifamily residential houses. The insurance companies that can uh, uh, help to reduce the risk for the financial institutions and or to help owners to get the funding. National and local public authorities providing financial incentives in different uh, ways to, uh, to split, to, to, to extend the market, to create the market and also energy service companies that are developing a new type of approach in providing the energy retrofits. And for each actor, risk and benefits must be, that, uh, must be well identified and captured in the contracts in order to, to understand which are the uh, uh, money flows, uh, the, the cash flows, and to understand the performance of So there are two 
different kind of benefits can uh, can arrive from a retrofit project. Basically, basically, there are some benefits that are directly related to the energy, like the energy savings that are leading to energy cost savings, a reduced exposure to price volatility, a re reduced consumption also make uh, make the owner well uh, uh, more uh, less sensible to the difference of the price of the energy prices due to and also in a case of large retrofit projects involving maybe some district or so on there are also the possibility to the de to define innovative services by energy providers like uh, new innovative uh, demand and response services and so on. But there are also other benefits that can be captured, like an increased asset value, some uh, dwellings or buildings that are out of the market because, because of their uh, poor performance from the energy point of view, may basically can uh, return on the market with an increased value if uh, some investments in energy retrofit are, are done and improve the cash flow of the owners of who pays the bill. Uh, new technology also usually has also a reduced operation and maintenance cost, especially in, uh, in the long term, and also a uh, comfortable environment for an energy point of view as also imply also an improved health and well-being for people living in that, uh, in that uh, the building or dwelling. On the other side, there are some risks associated to energy efficiency projects. Uh, the majority of risks are related to the performance, uh, are in the category of performance risk, preventing energy efficiency projects to reach the uh, goal expected during the project development and the design. Basically, the design risk, some problems during the design phase or a lack of coordination between the different uh, designers, architects, and uh, implementers in uh, implementing the different action. The equipment risk, like uh, some type of the equipment chosen to be installed, are not uh, performing exactly as they are stated by the manufacturers. Some operation and maintenance, maintenance risk, probably some under, understatement of the uh, Understatement of uh, a lack of uh, understanding of the uh, final cost for the maintenance or the operation of the specific equipment. Weather risk, the change of uh, weather condition can also uh, define a different, uh, can also reduce the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, energy measure, like in, in monetary savings or, or not. User behavior that was also mentioned before about how the user, the final user will use the new technologies and maybe changing some uh, habits or so on. So reducing the impact of the energy efficiency news. And also uh, energy price risk that is not controllable by the uh, project developers, but must be taken in account from the financial point of view if the energy price rise too, is too high, or on the other hand, the energy price is too much reduced, the effective uh, savings are, uh, will be reduced, and so the, mo the financial model is different. And also there are some different other factors that are related, uh, that, that could have a negative impact on the performance, basically related to the, to the regulatory risk, uh, related to, to the impact of uh, some decision taken by the national or uh, local authorities about the uh, use of certain technologies or the issues of incentives that could prevent, that could change the financial models, and also the credit risk, that is the, the analysis performed usually by investors to analyze the possibility of the different owners to repay the debt. Oh, sorry. Uh, currently, there are different financial models used for financing the energy retrofit model. 
the typically the, the most important one is a direct equity for the owner, or basically the involvement of banks or financial institu institutions to issue loan or market or mortgage or mortgages through a specific instrument uh, to support the direct equity from the owners. I see a part of TIFA is uh, the solution is uh, maybe the leasing of the energy efficiency products by the financial institution. There are the possible other kind of specialized energy service contracts like the energy performance contract issues by uh, usually issues by ESCO, but also other type of contracts like the chauffage contracts or efficiency services agreements or managers service agreements. There are also some secondary financing uh, uh, models that are based on forfeiting funds, bonds, or yield costs that are mainly used when we are dealing with uh, large, a large portfolio of investment that is not directly related to the uh, single owners, but mainly for a uh, larger real estate property manager or directly for local banks to, to get money to finance the, the single project. Uh, how the different demo case in uh, uh, Build It were financed. Build It, the, the Saragossa demo cases uh, was a, uh, was a uh, demo case owned by a public uh, owners, a single public owners. That is uh, a building dedicated to sheltered housing and uh, the, the financing was uh, and the financing was uh, through the involvement of the European investment bank and local banks to cover the cost beyond the EU contribution, in, uh, in inserting the demo cases in the uh, large portfolio of buildings owned by the Saragossa municipality to reach the minimum size of investment required by, by the European investment bank. Uh, there is the demo case in Salford that is, uh, was financed through the approach uh, from the Procur Plus. Procur Plus is a company, is an English company that has developed a, a specific model trying to create a, a network of suppliers of materials, of contractors, and a, and a, a network of clients. In this way, they can identify the better solution for the specific requirements of each client. And also, they are able to create a long-term relationship with clients and suppliers that are trust, uh, creating trust and understanding with, uh, with, uh, between the different actors. And also to support landlords in getting the maximum benefit from national incentives and in the relationship with the financial institutions. Finally, the Rome demo cases that, we, that is financed through a local ESCO where the dwelling owners will pay a periodic fee that is defined at the beginning of the project and the, key, uh, the ownership of the equipment remains to the ESCO until the final installment is paid. Uh, very quickly, the three different configurations to finance energy efficiency according to the various models. Basically, in the, this scheme, we have the, the central path with the owner that is a direct relation with the contractor and the finance institution that pay the, that provided the monetary resources to the owners. And also the owner is responsible for uh, paying the energy bill and to receive the incentives, uh, eventually the incentives available at national or local level. In the second model, we have a direct relation within the financial institution and the contractor in providing the, uh, the bonding, and the owners pay a part directly uh, at the beginning of the project in part to a um, specific install, to a periodic installment to the contractor. The owner is still responsible for paying the energy bill, so in this case, a reduced energy bill, 
and the incentives are shared between the owner and the contractor. In the last model, the, there is a direct investment of the financial institution that will get back the incentives and so on shared with the owner. And the direct investment of the financial institution directed to the contractor and uh, that will help the owner to pay the contract. And also the owner will have to pay back the debt directly to the financial institution. Uh, going to the, uh, the district level, it's very important to have a new entity able to manage the different relationship between the different uh, uh, actors involved. Basically, we call these uh, solutions like the DEGOV, District Energy Governance, that are in relationship with the building manager, the interface with the different owners, that are also connected with the designers and the local contractors to identify which are the uh, suitable solution for the energy efficiency as well as the part of the real implementation of this solution. And the local contractors and designers will also have a, a direct interaction with the building manager in order to uh, share the different characteristics of the buildings and so on. The DEGO will also have a, a part of the large private investors to the involvement of large private investors in also to pave the way for the local financial, financial institution to ensure that the owners have the uh, monetary resources to pay the, the intervention, the energy efficiency action. The role of insurance companies is important to, uh, to reduce the risk, both from the side of the technological risk, by providing additional warranties on the equipment, on the solution adopted, if the technological, if the manufacturer's warranties are not considered strong enough by the financial institution. But uh, insurance companies can also support the credit risk uh, evaluation by the financial institution to support, to, to reduce the risk for the financial institution in case the owners are not uh, able to repay the debt uh, due to different uh, reasons. An important part is also played by the public authorities with incentives, uh, issuing incentives in, uh, to support the owner and the local contractors in performing the actions. There are different kinds of uh, incentives due to like uh, feeding tariffs or tax deduction or so, and so on. But also public incentives can also be used in form of uh, funds or warranty funds to cover maybe the interest uh, paid by the owners uh, in when uh, asking for mortgage, mortgages or loans from financial institution, but also to provide the, the warranties as a guarantees for the owners. We are working on this model and uh, the work is uh, going on and uh, we are trying to uh, define the right figures to, to understand if the model can be well fit in the different uh, uh, demo cases that we are studying in the building project. And it is basically what uh, our work done. We are, uh, if you have a question, we are happy to answer them. And uh, this is my presentation. Thanks a lot, Federico. Uh, I think that uh, financial models and involving all actors are really a, support, a, a relevant supporting measure for these uh, retrofitting projects. Um, here, uh, I would quickly go to the last but not least, of course, the speaker. Uh, and I welcome uh, Professor uh, Anarita Ferrante, uh, please. The floor is yours to introduce uh, Abracadabra project. Uh, again, uh, I kindly ask you to be as quick uh, as possible, and I thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you. The floor is yours, Anarita. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will try to be as 
fast as possible in my presentation uh, on the Abracadabra project. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting us uh, in uh, this event. Uh, why a project on a deep renovation of existing buildings? In the solution, Abracadabra strategy, case studies, a case study that we will show, and conclusion. This is to outline the, uh, the main contents of the presentation. Uh, we know, I will try to be as fast as possible on these slides, because we know that uh, the residential building stock uh, uh, in Europe uh, uh, are estimated uh, um, as uh, accounting the 90% of the building uh, that we see today, and they will stay on and will be occupied uh, um, until uh, 2050. This is uh, from uh, Adrian Joyce and political approaches, pr practical approaches to building renovation strategies. So this is a quote. Um, the renovation rate uh, in uh, Europe uh, is uh, very low. It's still 1.4%. 1.5, someone said before, uh, and it is a market that only in Italy involves uh, about one, uh, uh, 11 million buildings, and this demonstrates that the most challenging uh, in energy efficiency uh, it involves mainly the existing building stock. Uh, and the challenge in the challenges uh, is given by the fact that the cost of retrofit is very high, and it's uh, uh, as higher as it, they, it, it include. Uh, uh, the more complete retrofit up to the deep renovation target of 60% uh, energy reduction in existing building. And we know that uh, the problem is uh, uh, given by uh, an economic and financial uh, aspect. Uh, we know that investments uh, for deep retrofitting operations uh, are about 30, 35 years. And for uh, nearly zero energy buildings, uh, these uh, uh, payback uh, can be up to 40 years. So that's very challenging. And uh, we were looking for uh, possible solutions to uh, overcome this uh, large barrier given by the economic aspects and uh, trying to, to find additional tools and measures to be developed at social, legislative, and market level to um, counterbalance this large payback time in uh, energy efficiency measures. So, um, next slide. Um, yeah, this is for the um, up to now for the uh, uh, let's say um, um, residential aspect of construction. But uh, on the uh, other side, at the urban level, we know that notwithstanding this poor uh, renovation and this poor rate uh, in new construction, we still consume a lot consume a lot of uh, new land. So there is a problem of land consumption and soil sealing that uh, increase uh, dramati dramatically, both in Italy and uh, in Europe. Uh, I will not go into the details of this slide, but we know that uh, per year, a an, an area larger than the city of Berlin is consumed. So we have to respond to this uh, uh, double, let's say, uh, problem. Uh, we have at the urban scale uh, the uh, necessity to rethink the, uh, the plan, uh, the plan of new uh, expansions, uh, and we have to face the soil consumption reduction. At the same time, on the existing buildings, we have to uh, lower the, um, uh, we, have the we have to, um, to overcome the low energy renovation rate and to achieve as much as possible very efficient and possibly nearly zero energy building for the next uh, future. So this solution, one possible solution could be uh, this, uh, a possible densification in the existing uh, urban extents, in the existing urban areas, uh, where uh, we can add uh, buildings instead than uh, uh, constructing new buildings uh, uh, on new, in new uh, uh, virgin lands outside the city. So could densification represent an alternative to this uh, problem? Uh, Abracadabra tried to uh, understand if a punctual densification policy in existing context uh, may 
uh, fostering investment in uh, nearly zero energy buildings within these contexts uh, context and uh, preserve the natural uh, urban the natural areas uh, around the urban uh, context the abracadabra strategy so is uh, focusing on the possibly on the possible uh, um, additional volumes uh, to be uh, added or to be yes uh, put in in, uh, um, in the context of uh, existing buildings and areas to counterbalance the cost of energy uh, retrofitting solution so the idea comes to create a sort of assistant building to addish to be uh, to be added uh, for retrofitting adopt, adopting cure and develop the actual buildings up to zero energy activating a market for deep renovation this is uh, the logo so we try to um, envision uh, this new uh, uh, concept of, of the adores, what we call the adores, system building addition and renewable, renewable energy sources that are able to create, uh, hopefully, uh, an upgrading synergy between old and new, between the old, the existing building and the new building. And to do this, uh, Abracadabra is a support and concert action, so we need to involve uh, a main stakeholder and prove the potential of the innovative building renovation based on this uh, strategy. So this is uh, a scheme. Uh, the idea is uh, uh, to uh, produce uh, investment in uh, outdoors, uh, renewable energy sources, and uh, deep energy retrofit measures uh, to produce uh, nearly zero energy building and this uh, will uh, give us the possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, creating uh, a, a, an, economic, uh, an economic profits, uh, an added value uh, and plus the energy saving efficiency. Uh, so we're looking for having environmental benefit uh, and social benefit uh, a target to policy makers and uh, profit of investment and brick even points for the market actors uh, of the um, of this process uh, the add-ons or the add-ons uh, we are uh, we have classified some possible uh, some possible um, uh, kinds of uh, adults, we have ground, top side, facade, depending on the, the possibility given by the specific building or the assistant building uh, as a, 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 a new building that can create this synergy between the old and the new. Um, we tried to use uh, this uh, scheme in uh, several uh, case studies. Uh, we do have uh, the initial pilots here uh, all over the participating countries in Europe and uh, we are going to um, demonstrate some specific cases. This is one from uh, Bologna. Uh, these are cases in which we put some aside addition, for example, on the existing building and uh, we can see from uh, yeah, the 3D model uh, which are the parts of the building that we are thinking to add uh, and we see from uh, the normal payback time how the uh, different kind of uh, scenarios and options that we may have um, uh, depending on uh, the intensity of this uh, uh, increase uh, in volumes uh, will give will uh, pa will um, yes will pass the, the payback uh, time from 27 years uh, up to zero years, uh, zero years considering to sell or to um, to to capitalize uh, the new uh, building value at the zero point, the starting point. Of course, we will have uh, some years here, one or two years uh, as a current rate now. Uh, the densification strategy has been studied uh, for the case study of uh, Corticella, which is a large uh, com Compact, uh, urban uh, con context uh, in the northern parts of uh, Bologna. We have uh, produced uh, an economical feasibility study to understand which are the costs of uh, energy renovation with energy renovation packages and uh, uh, on uh, addition with new uh, addition. And we see here a comparison of uh, scenarios given by the construction costs, renovation costs, and real estate and the potential profit uh, given from the different uh, options uh, uh, that we have. So 
while uh, the deep renovation we do not have uh, uh, any potential profits we see for the top uh, uh, for the uh, top aside facade and assistant building addition we do have uh, a lot of uh, potential profit that of course is very um, very different from uh, uh, the top to the uh, assistant building, for example, and it is uh, a negative profit for the facade addition because we are not thinking to capitalize this kind of uh, real estate increase value in, in, um, in the sense that the facade addition is something that uh, uh, adds extension to the existing units and not uh, cannot be sell uh, in, an, uh, in a free market, let's say. Uh, so um, we have uh, uh, the most profitable scenario that is uh, almost always given by the assistant building. So the new the new building uh, that creates this uh, synergy with uh, with uh, the existing. And uh, here we have uh, uh, um, overall uh, scenario given by sorry some of these are still in Italian. This is the cost of the intervention. We have uh, the energy saving here. Uh, uh, and we have the profit of a different uh, situation uh, in the um, Corticella case studies. Uh, we can see here the uh, additional building that we may have uh, in, uh, in, uh, this, uh, in this case. So uh, we see here, these are almost in uh, this uh, uh, line on uh, the bottom uh, of this, uh, of this um, slide, uh, all the um, uh, payback time given by the uh, several options uh, uh, studied for each one of the buildings in the, in the, in the urban context. And we do have here, uh, instead, um, the uh, normal uh, uh, the normal deep retrofitting uh, scenario. This is uh, given by the uh, a retrofit scenario with uh, uh, without any addition, and this is given by the facade addition. Uh, so we see uh, that for these two options, we still uh, we still uh, oscillate between uh, uh, the 45, uh, 70 years and 30, 35 years. Why? the payback time is almost close to the zero for the all other higher, higher transformation options. So uh, this is, um, yeah, okay. Uh, we also see that uh, it is possible, uh, notwithstanding all these uh, uh, extra surface addition, to save uh, the permeable surfaces by using uh, the green roof uh, and by reusing uh, some of uh, the impermeable flooring uh, in, uh, and turn them in uh, permeable flooring. So we try also to respond in uh, these higher transformation scenarios to the problem of the soil sealing that we were mentioning uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Another interesting area in the same context is given by, and this maybe will open uh, the, the debate about public uh, and uh, private residential uh, situation that we have to focus uh, and to target in uh, the deep renovation uh, operation. This is uh, instead uh, a, a portion of the same area that is all uh, public owned, and uh, we try to understand uh, how we could apply some uh, of the strategies uh, uh, developed by the Abracadabra project also in this, uh, in this area, maybe with a public-private partnership that could uh, give uh, the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of um, profit for this, uh, for this case. And we see, for example, uh, going back to the previous, uh, the possible punctual addition of, of uh, tower buildings uh, and uh, buildings uh, uh, around and over the uh, public owned uh, area. Uh, and uh, we can see that this is very much profitable uh, uh, already. Uh, we can uh, have a profit from this kind of uh, um, addition uh, that uh, will be able to uh, pay back the deep renovation of all the public buildings, so the supermarket, uh, the public complex, the gym center, and the school, uh, 
that could uh, also repay the green roof replacement and, of course, all the renewable that we need for the zero energy target in this, uh, in this context. And plus, we could have a, a, a final profit. So this is something very interesting for possible investors uh, that could uh, produce a public-private uh, partnership for this. So these are just uh, very, um, let's say, uh, uh, not detailed uh, uh, slides about the possible design of this, uh, um, of this uh, area, where, of course, so we can link uh, this addition to a, a redesign and regeneration of uh, the outer spaces, of the outdoor spaces, uh, in order to make uh, them uh, more uh, also uh, acceptable uh, for uh, the uh, current users and uh, the, um, the uh, current inhabitants uh, in the area. You always see some uh, densification and plus the urban uh, uh, outdoor spaces. So for conclusion, that was also part of the outcomes that we had in our uh, uh, seven rounds of uh, national meetings that were produced and giving outputs for, uh, for the international workshop. Uh, and so uh, in all these uh, uh, meetings, we understand from the different countries that are involved in the project that there is a strong need for uh, social measures, uh, uh, creating social measures, neighborhood services, uh, uh, and uh, parking areas uh, together with the environmental measures in order to make this kind of, of strategy more acceptable for public body and for the social uh, um, uh, and from the, from, uh, from the social uh, aspect uh, also we do have uh, some technical uh, necessity of uh, integration uh, because we need to integrate uh, uh, let's say um, different uh, um, uh, requirements uh, from the technical point of view uh, of the building. So maybe we, are, we have also to think to the possibility of uh, uh, integrate uh, the energy uh, renovation with seismic, seismic and static uh, structural improvement that uh, can be done with this kind of uh, uh, higher transformation in building. Uh, yeah. Uh, the strategy so far has shown a strong impact in the cost analysis evaluation, but uh, there are, of course, upfront costs that are required. So uh, the Abracadabra strategy uh, uh, now aims to respond to this need with uh, uh, incentive schemes for others uh, for, uh, improvement, for, for improvement all, uh, of the assistant building uh, option uh, in uh, the existing context increasing the confidence to the stakeholder and lowering the risk uh, for uh, investors. Uh, so we are now working on this uh, final phase of the project. Uh, we have already yes, shown this. Uh, we are trying to integrate uh, uh, this uh, strategy for uh, the social benefit uh, of uh, the, uh, of the um, boundary conditions in the, in the, the neighborhoods and uh, promote a, a sustainable densification limiting the soil ceiling uh, and try to also to create uh, an assistant building option that might be pos positioned in a strategic area to increase uh, the real estate value of uh, the whole contest. So, uh, yeah, mm, we do think that uh, retrofit uh, through adults could represent a valid strategy uh, we have seen that the payback of investment is reduced thanks to the uh, adults um, and uh, the abracadabra can have a great potential in the context of the urban renovation and urban regeneration as a whole, uh, trying to, yeah, to, to make more attractive uh, the uh, deep renovation measures for investors and for uh, users. So it's just about to put uh, things to work together in the, let's say, ecological and sustainable uh, approach. Uh, yeah, just to conclude, uh, please enter the Abra community and visit our uh, site, website of, uh, of uh, to be, to be, to be uh, updated about all the progress of the project. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Anna Gita, for this 
very interesting um, outline of abracadabra projects, uh, this functional densification uh, policy together with uh, the market activation from Adors, I think it's really uh, interesting and gives us um, food for thought and for uh, discussion. Um, thank you everybody. I know it's really hard to squeeze years of innovation and experience in 15 minutes. <laughs> thank you for uh, your effort uh, in doing so. I would open uh, the session for um, question time by asking um, all of you one question from uh, from my side. Uh, we went throughout all these uh, interesting projects and these are uh, implemented in specific building and I think that the type of ownership related to these buildings, whether it's a publicly or privately owned, can be something really uh, essential to be taken into account when we are doing this retrofitting project. So the question for all of you is how this influence the success and timely completion of, the, of this work. Is it easier doing retrofitting at works with uh, publicly owned buildings or the opposite holds true with, with private buildings? So what's your experience? Uh, Roberto, and then uh, all other uh, projects. Thank you. Yeah, uh, from maybe uh, shortly from my perspective, it's much easier to work with public owned uh, building with social housing, for example, uh, companies. Uh, the point is that at least in Italy, most of the building stock is private owned. So if you want to really, um, yeah, um, impact on the on the retrofit of the building stock, we need to also take into consideration solutions that are good for for the private. And I really much appreciated the the last presentation by Abracadabra. Um, showing that th there are solutions to uh, that um, that are interesting for investors, and, and, and with this respect, I have a couple of questions later on. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Roberto. Rizal, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Well, actually, my answer, based on the experience in P2NG project, uh, is on opposite of uh, Roberto's answer. Um, our experience, um, it is more difficult to, to uh, uh, work on deep renovation uh, project with public owners. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the cases that we are dealing with is in Poland, this nursery building in Poland. There are basically three main uh, constraints uh, uh, within this uh, deep renovation uh, process. The first one is procurement. Uh, since we are going to introduce and implement these innovative solutions, innovative products, the plug and play, uh, which are not just so familiar on the market, uh, the uh, requirements, the tender requirements, since the public bodies is, is, are usually bound to public tenders, uh, are not yet able to cope with these new products. So in our uh, case, uh, several products are listed, but uh, when we are trying to introduce these new solutions, they are they're not really uh, eager to, to include this in the list because they don't have any ex previous experience yet, because they have to uh, prove the value for money, and so forth and so forth. That's the, the first challenge. The second challenge is I think it has uh, a lot to do with the budgetary regulation for a public body. Uh, most public body are, uh, are bound to annual or several multi-annual budget uh, planning. So when we told them that probably in terms of uh, investment for renovation, the cost saving is not as much as we expected, but the, uh, in the long run, so the life cycle cost saving will be really significant. Although they want to believe in that, they said, but it's out of our mandate. 
So our mandate within the procurement department is bound with this uh, annual or multi-annual budget. So they are not able to take into account the long-term benefit of the exploitation of the building. And last but not least, uh, this building is a nursery building. As I mentioned, one of the ideas is the rooftop retrofit solution, which is really uh, a wanted solution by the building operator, which is a, the, the social department of the municipality. Uh, because they need more space, they want to accommodate more children, they want to increase comfort, and so on. And they can also prove that financially this will be really beneficial over uh, over time. But the building department, which also belongs to the municipality, the same municipality, but a separate uh, entity, cannot support this. Because they say, yeah, then the other department will, uh, will gain the benefit, but we have to invest more for the rooftop retrofit. And this is not fitting in our plan. So, I mean, uh, I think it's typical to public bodies, like this fragmentation of uh, decision making. And, uh, yeah, I think this is uh, what I can share with you based on our real experience in, in one of our projects. Thank you very much, Rizal. Uh, Analita. Okay, I would say, uh, yes, we know that private-owned buildings uh, are about 60-70% of existing building uh, ownership in Europe uh, as a whole, and uh, I think that in Italy it's still a little bit more, it's also a little bit more, sorry. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the biggest impact is given by these private-owned buildings, but I see uh, that very often uh, European project uh, uh, and uh, demonstration cases focus on uh, uh, public building. I, I guess this is uh, mainly due to the fact that uh, uh, it is uh, something that uh, gives uh, the opportunity of uh, acting on buildings that are, uh, uh, that have a single owner in a way. So I would say that the problem is mostly, is much more on uh, uh, let's say frag fragmented ownership uh, uh, versus uh, one single large, let's say, private owned building. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is the case in which you, you do not have to convince so many people, uh, uh, even though we know that uh, the uh, ownership and the fragmented own ownership in uh, block building, uh, such as condominiums, represent the large majority of uh, building stock. So, uh, of course, uh, it's easier uh, to, to take all to deal uh, with the case of uh, a large uh, private uh, or public-owned uh, building, uh, uh, while it's very difficult to, uh, to engage uh, single uh, private apartment uh, owners uh, uh, to uh, to join an action of uh, retrofit. Uh, this is, I think, the big uh, challenge, uh, challenge uh, that we have to face. And of course, uh, uh, abracadabra can help, uh, but uh, we know that the upfront cost of these kind of operations are higher. So, of course, we need uh, in uh, uh, this kind of paradigm shift, uh, mm -hmm. so a sort of. Uh, uh, new models, new financial models, and uh, I was very interested in uh, uh, the previous presentation because so we do really need uh, um, new uh, paradigmatic uh, shifts in uh, financing uh, uh, financing models to to achieve uh, this uh, challenging of uh, this challenge um, of uh, nearly zero energy or uh, deep renovation in the existing building stock. Thank you very much, uh, Anarita. Um, I know Roberto has a, a couple of uh, points for you. Uh, Roberto, if you have questions for our Cadabra. Yeah, in fact, I have questions for, for Pito and Dior and to Abracadabra and for Abracadabra. Um, starting from, from the last, um, my question was, um, um, yeah, as I, as I said before, I think the, the approach is very interesting and promising. My question is, um, in your opinion or in your experience, what is the, 
um, how easy it is to convince owners to um, yeah, add pieces uh, of, a, of a new building to the old one. And from the regulation and authorization point of view, authorizations point of view, how easy it is to, to get the authorizations for, for adding new floors on top or, or new staircases on, on the side of, of the building. This is the first question for Abac Abracadabra, so how easy is to is to implement the project and uh, the, the process? And for P2 Endure, uh, the question is um, uh, how much the two first M's uh, pay off in the, in the market, in your opinion, again, or in your experience? So how much, um, say, the... Um, the, the assessment of the of the building and the and the modeling of the building uh, are accepted or requested by the construction market. Thank you, Marcelli. So, okay, try to respond. How easy is for the owners and how easy is for the regulation? Let's say just to um, simplify. Uh, for the owners. Uh, Mm, our experience is that uh, if it is, uh, let's say, a gift, and especially if it is combined with the facade addition, that uh, of course is an extension of the existing units, uh, that is very much uh, um, attractive for them and very much acceptable. Uh, of course, uh, they have to be, uh, let's say, involved in the process because it's uh, a process that is... Uh, quite, uh, let's say, demanding in terms of uh, impact during the execution works. That's why we should uh, start to think uh, to plug and play and the prefabricated solution to try to uh, reduce costs, uh, cost and uh, time of uh, renovation. Uh, so I would say that for the owners, uh, uh, if uh, the top addition, uh, for example, is combined with a facade addition, uh, would be uh, much more acceptable for them to have new uh, owners uh, in the same building, for example. And uh, this is something that we have experienced in some of uh, our uh, feasibility studies. Uh, for the regulation, uh, which is... Uh, a problem, of course, because uh, we do have in Europe uh, a very different and jeopardized uh, situation for uh, the, these. Uh, for the abracadabra, we have a little success, let's say, because we started uh, now almost three years ago um, uh, talking with the public administrations and uh, municipalities and regions, uh, and we recently uh, came uh, up with a new uh, uh, legislation for the region Emilia-Romagna that will allow uh, densification and additions uh, uh, for uh, regeneration in urban contexts. So, uh, something is moving on this. Of course, so we we also participate participate in this in this change ch change. Sorry, uh, but uh, still uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do. Um, but for example, in other countries like uh, the Netherlands, that is one of the part of partner uh, in Abracadabra, we know that uh, uh, they are much more flexible and they can uh, uh, always. Uh, um, use a sort of uh, public-private uh, uh, agreement, uh, uh, making buildings larger or higher uh, than uh, the original building with the, uh, the strategy of uh, addition. Uh, so they were the um, cases uh, on which we uh, started this uh, adventure and uh, they were best practices that we uh, considering at the beginning of the project. So we know that in Europe there is a very uh, different uh, uh, regulatory uh, frame and uh, the, um, the sad part <laughs> is that uh, the, uh, the countries, uh, uh, mainly, uh, namely the, um, the southern countries that would need uh, a change in the market renovation like uh, Italy, Greece or Spain and so on, are uh, indeed the, par the, par the partners and the countries where uh, uh, this uh, regulation is uh, much more uh, strict than uh, in uh, other countries. So it's time to, to produce a sort of uh, legislative regulation uh, uh, revolution for uh, this kind of uh, market uptake that we need. 
uh, in uh, Emilia Romagna we make a little change that there is something that is uh, very um, we measure this like a success uh, like the partial success of the of the project. Yes, in, in addition to Anarita's opinion, I think <coughs> uh, the the biggest challenge is when you have to deal with historic buildings uh, or monuments. So uh, the, the regulatory constraints to make changes, uh, especially the exterior of the building, uh, are, are quite uh, quite large. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. It, yeah, we did not. Uh, we didn't consider the historical building here. The focus of the project was uh, uh, where um, was the, yes given by the building of the 60, 70 uh, onwards, and uh, yeah, we excluded uh, the historical areas because uh, even though there are some very excellent examples uh, from uh, the British countries, for example, that uh, they were. Um, displayed in our uh, uh, international workshop uh, that can be also given by the um, uh, proper and delicate uh, and not invasive addition of a new building uh, within a historical context. Nonetheless, we didn't, uh, we didn't focus on this part of uh, the building stock. Right. Uh, in P2NG, we do have several buildings, uh, which are historic buildings, and most of them are in Italy. Um, well, actually, uh, this is the bridge to answering Roberto's question on P2NG, but the two first stages, um, mapping and making, uh, what is the uh, market response for this approach? I think uh, for mapping, the, the response has been very positive, especially um, talking about historic buildings or monuments because obviously before you take any decision to invest in deep renovation or deep retrofitting, you want to know uh, what is the condition of the building. In some cases, uh, the owner could opt for a smaller scale uh, renovation and in some extreme cases, the conclusion would be, uh, except for monuments of course, uh, demolition could be more economical than, uh, than deep retrofitting. So uh, the acceptance, the market acceptance is really high for mapping, especially because we also introduced some, well, uh, practical and uh, affordable solutions supported by the IT tools. For modeling, uh, it's a different situation since uh, both the BIM parametric modeler as well as the BEM, so building energy modeling simulations, are quite new. Uh, we are still at the prototype level, and as I mentioned during my presentation, BEM is still an ongoing development in many research projects. So yes, there is uh, there is interest uh, to be able to get an insight into the final performance after renovation in the early design stage, but uh, in P2NG we don't have yet any market-ready solution uh, that we can, let's say, literally sell. Uh, during or uh, immediately after the project. I hope it answers your question, Roberto. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you also. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's a really great uh, discussion. Uh, I would also quickly open it to the participants. Um, if you want to interact with the speaker, you can either use the chat box or raise your hand by clicking at on the icon at the top of your center screen. So if you want to ask any question to the presenters, unfortunately, Hard Project has left us some time ago, but maybe other questions come from the participants. Okay, um, well, uh, do you have any other uh, questions, uh, presenters? Here, I refer to you. Would you like to continue with the, this exchange? It has been very useful. Uh, Marcelo, thanks once again for your initiative and for organizing and uh, chairing the session. Uh, I suppose that you will send us a link where we can uh, download the recorded a session? Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, that's correct. That's correct.
It would it be uh, also possible to download the presentation handouts? Because uh, I, I have seen a lot of interesting stuff from the other projects, and uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot memorize everything just in a very short time, to be honest. Of course, of course. Uh, that would be the possibility to follow up, of course, uh, and we will share uh, all the information. So I thank uh, all of you very much for your active uh, participation. Uh, we hope you had a great start of your day with plenty of ideas uh, to take home and to share with your uh, colleagues. Um, again, uh, as I said before, we will soon publish the webinar recordings, so you can post it on your website, social media. And again, uh, I thank you. And from the build it from my side, we look forward uh, to other collaboration opportunities with you. I would close the webinar, and, uh, and I will wish you a very good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all for participating.